Hello and welcome to a shock the fourth wall. Our next ring manga takes things in a very interesting direction. It's fun to take established horror icons and put them in a new setting. See how things will play out if, say, you put Jason Voorhees in New York City instead of an isolated campground. Or Jason Voorhees in space. Or Jason Voorhees in hell, aka as a demon worm possessing people. You know, Friday the 13th has done this a lot. The point is, have you ever thought about taking this monster and putting them in a scenario that could challenge how they do things going forward? I mean, sure, Freddy Krueger is dangerous, but what happens if he no longer has any victims in the world? Ever. What is Dracula with no one's blood left to drink? And thus we have Sadako at the end of the world, where our long-haired ghost girl must contend with a post-apocalyptic Earth. Post-apocalyptic stories are fun because there are several directions you can take them in. The breakdown of society and the horrors that can stem from that, finding humanity again when there's so little of it left, creating wacky new societies based on misunderstandings of or hyperfixations on the old world, or create new Erstotska with an independent new Vegas. Add on a supernatural curse into that and you've got the makings of something unique, bizarre, and maybe fun, but can even Sadako's hatred sustain itself when there's nothing left to rage against? So let's dig into Sadako at the end of the world and see how that goes. Normally manga covers aren't too important, but I actually rather like this one. It's pretty decently representative of the contents. Sadako with two children and carrying around a tablet to communicate. Honestly, my only critique is that the background doesn't look too post-apocalyptic. Sure, nature reclaiming a city makes sense, but when you think the end of the world, you think brown, gray, ruins, etc. Not green. Also, I think the artists spilled their juice on the art given these red splotches. Let's look at the back cover. In a world torn apart by an apocalypse, two lonely little girls chance upon a strange video. A whole video devoted to the rainbow sponge. The rest gives away the plot, so let's get started at chapter one, I and He-Chan. Wait, I? Was he the teenage sex bot plan to end wars and E-Robot was a dismal failure? We open with Sadako crawling out of a TV, which of course usually only happens at the end of the seven day wait, but hey, this is non-canon, so we can play with the rules a bit. Sadako is a ghost who emerges from a cursed video. But her best work was when she was indie. Everyone who watches the video, even children, will be killed by the curse of Sadako in one week's time. By having their DNA altered by magnetic tape so that you get a heart attack or you give birth to a clone of her. No, I'm still not over that. However, the two girls do not know any of this, so much to Sadako's confusion, they just smile at her and exclaim, Wowee! That was our first video! Oh, good one, Sadako. Now you've raised the bar for every other videotape they watch now. But who cares about that? We haven't seen a real moving person in forever! And the not moving ones don't taste very good. Wow, we can even touch her! Is this that 3D stuff? Oh god, civilization will get restored and these kids will champion another 3D gimmick craze in movies! The tech they had in the olden days sure is something. These kids are gonna find out about Laserdisc and scream for hours in excitement. 
They ask Sadako what her name is, and, well, this is using the standard image and idea of Sadako rather than any specific continuity where she has spoken, Rasen, Sadako 3D, etc. So she can't actually communicate with them. I, the older girl, figures that she can't talk because the speaker on the TV's busted. Man, imagine how powerful Sadako's voice will be if they can get the subwoofers going. Fortunately, nearby, there's an old iPad or whatever, and Sadako is able to create writing on it, displaying her name in Japanese. Writing? Cool! But how do you read that? Ugh! What are they even teaching kids in the post-apocalypse? We'd better cut education funding even more. That'll show them. Fortunately, probably thanks to her psychic powers, Sadako is able to get them to read what it says, or at least her meaning, and present it in English for us. I and he formally introduce themselves to her, and Sadako asks about where other people are, and I says there aren't any. It's just the two of them, and we get this two-punch beautiful shot of the wasteland alongside Sadako just standing, silent upon that revelation, with only the rustling of leaves for sound. It's like she's trying to process that information and can't believe it. While Sadako deals with that, I tries to put in another tape, but it doesn't play. Weird. Yours is the only video that works. Oh no! Beta! I joke with that clip, but I actually suggest that maybe the two tapes are different kinds of tapes. Still, she's optimistic that they'll see the other one someday, and maybe summon forth more friends like Sadako. It's cute. They then ask Sadako for how long they can watch her tape, and she says one week. Two if we can find a tape rewinder. I think this means Sadako has to leave in a week, and our ghost girl fails to correct her, instead just inquiring again about the lack of people. Never seen any around here, nope. One nice thing about this apocalypse, no bearded idiots punching chicken robots while screaming that they're a man. I considers that if they search the world, maybe they'll find someone else. Sadako has to consider the possibility this presents. If these girls really are the last survivors, then my curse ends with them. God, I'm gonna have to get a job! He invites Sadako to play with her, with whatever's in that bucket. Play-Doh? I don't know. This really is an interesting phenomenon, if only because never in the franchise do we ever see Sadako encountering legit innocence before. The closest we got is Yoichi, who frankly seemed pretty annoyed by the world, and Sadako had to trick him to watch the tape, assuming that was Sadako at all, and not that his cousin's ghost was a jerk. Plus, he had his own psychic powers that probably screwed with him. But just, like, little kids talking to her innocently without fear, wanting to play with her? Sure, part of that is that Sadako doesn't normally appear outside the tape until the seven-day time limit runs out, and even when she does, it's usually just a jump scare to indicate the curse is following them rather than a sustained conversation. But the franchise has shown Sadako communicating with people before. Although, admittedly, there probably isn't a lot you can talk with her about. So, how's life been with you? Still dead, still stuck in a tape, still lots of static. Mm, that's cool. Oh, hey, there's a new Star Wars movie coming out! What's a Star Wars? When the two decide to move on, Sadako follows along with them, though her ghostly presence mostly means she seems to disappear and reappear at various times, but still not spooking them. That night, they invite Sadako to share a bed with them in an abandoned house. Sadako searched the area, but indeed, there was nobody else around. God, open world games suck if there's nothing to actually do in the open world! Sadako thought, If there are other survivors, I want to curse them all. Sadako begins her pyramid scheme. The girls even give Sadako a blanket and tell her that they'll go look for more people tomorrow. Back when there were lots of people, friends and strangers would come together to laugh and cry and do all sorts of stuff. Usually all at the same time if they're watching the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. And since I wants that feeling again, she figures they can get together with people and watch Sadako's video. Which, as you can see, she's all in on. Weird to think of Sadako going woohoo, but good for her. I asks her if she has any dreams or goals, which she does, but telling would be spoilers. So when they fall asleep, she writes out how she's there to curse them, ending the first chapter. Thus we enter chapter two, Yamane the Beautician. Business is slow after the apocalypse, yet still somehow fully booked for days. Sadako is the ghost of the cursed video. She's currently searching for other people with the help of two girls who watched her video. That's cool, but when does Sadako get the invitation to join the Brotherhood of Steel? Sadako thinks that I pulling he in a wagon resembles Lone Wolf and Cub, which, yeah, if we assume Sadako died in the early 70s, she would know that reference. I mean, I did that Star Wars joke earlier, but do we know if Sadako has kept up with any pop culture since she died in the well? The later movies put her on the internet, sure, but I don't know how much she really engages with communities other than tape traders. They're heading towards where they think a city is, I commenting that they hopefully won't run into a bad guy. Someone who could attack us with a weapon. And she gets hit in the face with a towel. Oh my god, Arthur Dent's gone berserk! 
Actually, it belongs to the titular beautician, who suddenly notices them approaching. However, when Sonico sees the scissors in their hand, she assumes it's a weapon, unleashing her hair as tendrils around their neck. Yeah, you guys haven't seen this power yet, but indeed, Sadako's hair is actually a weapon she can use. You'll see it in action more next time in the late night double feature for Sadako 3D. I should note that I don't actually know Yamane's gender. I looked up the name, which is apparently usually a female name, but we never see pronouns assigned to them, and the character notes specifically say that they speak with an effeminate voice, which feels like it shouldn't be necessary to point out if they're already a woman. Plus, not to put too fine a point on it, there is the old stereotype of the gay hairdresser, so yeah, I'm just gonna use they, them, since I can't be certain. Anyway, the girls wonder why she's doing this, while Yamane has a different concern than they're choking. Your cuticles are all dead! The confusion from that remark gets Sadako to release them, especially when they yell, This hair is not getting cared for at all! What a waste of that long, beautiful black hair! You know, nobody's ever tried to shame Sadako for her hygiene before. Could be a winning strategy, you never know. Yamane proclaims that they're going to revive that dead hair of hers. In their shop, they explain how they're a beautician. Beautician? I'm like a wizard who draws out the beauty in people. I also used to be able to turn people into frogs, but then they discontinued that shampoo. They demonstrate by quickly changing up He's hairstyle, which also magically makes her eyes sparkle and dandelions appear around her? Anyway, I also wants to turn while Sadako tries to sneak off, but Yamane insists she come back to try to do something with her hair. Sadako absolutely refuses to have her bangs cut, but Yamane insists on at least taking care of her split ends. That feeling of scissors slicing through hair. So fun, I'm tempted to chop it all off. Oh god, Yamane is one of those people who went nutty after the apocalypse and started collecting people's cut off heads or something. Actually, no, though even Sadako's going chill out. They give some advice about maintaining her hair, but does note that it might be difficult because they might not have access to power. The salon still does, but who knows how long it'll last. They ask about where the girls came from, I explaining that they've just been walking for a really long time. Oh, but Sadako came from a video! But she doesn't like to talk about when her channel was all just prank stuff. Video? You mean those old tapes from way back then? Sadako? Did you have a jazzercise tape? Yamane notes that the idea of Sadako coming out of a videotape reminds them of a story they once heard from a customer, but before they can blow dry Sadako's hair, power goes out. Fortunately, Sadako has both magic and psychic powers, so she gets it running again and soon her hair is looking much prettier. And yes, just because I know people will comment on it, check out A Haircut Story of a Ghost, a horror comedy short that's basically this premise. Anyway, Yamane offers to let them stay as their assistant, but since Sadako's only going to be with the two for a week, they want to go as far as they can with her. You mentioned Sada-chan popping out when you played that video. Now, since I've met her, does that count as me watching the video myself? I don't know, Sadako. Do you really want to murder someone because of a technicality? Seems like a cheat. However, the manga informs us that indeed, meeting Sadako counts as watching the video. I should note that... No, the movies don't seem to back that up. From the very first ring kill in the original film, Masami, Tamako's friend who was with her when she got killed by Sadako, spotted her but did not die. Admittedly, she did get disturbed by the experience to the point where she was still having issues into Sadako 2019, but she did not die from seeing her. Anyway, despite my joke, Sadako is apparently more than pleased with that rationale. As they leave, Yamane advises them that there are two more ghost towns to pass through before reaching a residential area, but they may not encounter anyone. Business isn't exactly booming around here either. But hey, no more government that I have to pay property taxes to, so I'm keeping this place open. They even offer to come with, but Sadako says she'll protect the girls. Once they leave, Yamane starts cleaning up the store, only to find Sadako waiting for them. Remembering the stuff about the videotape, they see Sadako's hair tendrils start to go around their neck. It seems they now know who Sadako is, but they aren't afraid or angry or upset simply thanking Sadako for the chance to touch her hair and work on it, telling her to brush it every day. We don't see Sadako kill them, but we can presume that's what happened, especially as Sadako returns to the girls and her hair is messed up again. Ah, jeez, you should have taken Yamane with you if that was what was going to happen. And thus we begin our next chapter, Granny is a Witch. Oh, come on, it's after the apocalypse. You're in no position to be judgy.
It's been four days since the girls met Sadako, and they still haven't found anyone new. In the residential area, he spots a photo in an abandoned house. Face paper! No, no, silly he. Face paper is when I'm writing a script and I take the paper and do this. <laughs> I says it looks like a picture of a mother and daughter who probably lived here, but then they suddenly notice that Sadako doesn't have any shoes and has been walking around barefoot this entire time. No need. John McClane's got nothing on me. But no, they say it's dangerous to run around barefoot, so they find a pair of shoes in the house for her to wear. They're a bit disappointed because they were supposed to find people here, but haven't had any luck. We run into three killer robots, a death claw, and a bunch of zombies, but no real people. <sighs> ah well, let's try our luck tomorrow when we get beyond that Thunderdome. They settle in to sleep for the night when they suddenly smell someone cooking. Oh good, they found the cannibals! No, it's an old lady who invites them in when they come to her window. All I have are fruits and veggies from the field here, but please eat up. They're only slightly radioactive. I explains that they've been surviving on canned and packaged food her dad left behind, but then realizes she wasn't supposed to tell that. But that's as much info as we get about her dad. Presumably he died, which the old woman seems to think was the case, and they ask her about her family. She says she has a daughter who hasn't stopped by in a while. He notices the same photograph they found at the house. The old woman suggesting that that was her daughter's house, but is disappointed that they didn't run into her there. She seems to imply that she believes her to be gone when she says that Sadako is wearing her daughter's favorite pair of shoes. The kids, on the other hand, don't seem to understand the larger situation of the world, suggesting that everyone just moved away. I mean, technically that's true. Where are all the dead bodies? That night, Sadako gets up to talk to the old woman, who's looking at her photo album. A neat little moment is that her turning her head to look at Sadako reminds her of her own mother. It's not commented on, but the art makes it clear that that's what's being implied. The old woman shares the photos with Sadako, talking about how she used to be an actress herself. It's another nice little bonding moment between the two. I didn't think you could talk, but I suppose that magic screen can talk for you. Magic? Well, those things make $800 disappear if you break them, so yeah, I'd say it's magic. Sadako asks if she's not acting anymore. Oh, life has become like a one-person play. Admittedly, no one came to my one-woman show before the apocalypse, but still. It turned into a make-believe world before you knew it. Unfortunately, it's a Twilight Zone episode. I keep having to shoo off Rod Serling whenever he stops by to narrate over me. She says that she's okay with dying soon. She only really held out because she thought her daughter might need her, but it's pretty clear she's gone now. A story can't exist without someone to keep it going. What kind of story are you telling, my magic little girl? Lady, I'm at least 50 by now. I spent more than half my life in a well. I wakes up because of their conversation, and Sadako, upon talking about how the old lady is an actress, and having to explain what an actress is, seems to suggest that they have the old lady put on a performance for them. The old lady suggests they do Hansel and Gretel, with her being the old witch in the woods, while the two of them can be the kids. Using a digital projector that Sadako's able to get running, and some clothes that they grab from the nearby town, they all play act it, he eventually waking up and joining them. Looks like we found a second Gretel! Oh my god, they're completely off scripted this point. This is worse than the place Sadako was in right before she died. But no, everything ends happily and wholesomely. The next morning, the old lady loads up their cart with her food and even gifts Sadako the shoes, saying, anyone still up on the stage of life needs a good pair. And so they head out, the old lady passing away without Sadako's intervention as she holds the photograph of her daughter. A little bittersweet, this chapter, kind of a tearjerker, so let's take a moment to talk about Sadako the character for a second. Something I saw discussed last year in the comments is that the problem with Sadako is less that she's a ghost, but rather she's a curse. That it's not like dealing with a person, but rather their rage and anger made manifest. Thus, you can't reason with it or do anything to actively stop it beyond the conditions set out to save you. Problem is, the franchise doesn't back up that interpretation. Sadako is seen multiple times as an active, planning, intelligent figure. One who has made deals and will occasionally have a larger goal in mind than just her revenge. Frequently, that's her attempt at bringing herself back to life. And fair enough, she got a raw deal. But she's definitely not just the curse. She is indeed a ghost. I'd say you could argue the curse angle for Kayako of the Grudge series, Though even then, she's executed a plan once or twice outside to come in my house and die horribly. Plus, Kayako is a stinky cheater. 
Come on, you can't just teleport someone into the house to their curse now. Dick move! Anyway, the point is that this story is an exploration of Sadako where she's freed from the usual confines of her curse, of people accidentally viewing or spreading the curse around. Sure, her goal is still to spread it around. You can't cure 30 years of rage and sadness with a long hike with some kids. But we are seeing what she truly lost because of her murder. Humanity. Let's move on to Chapter 4, The Girl of Plate Manor. Day 6, they still haven't met anyone else since the old lady. With only one day left with Sadako, I wonders if they could watch the tape again to reset the counter. Something that some have asked if that's a thing. But no, it doesn't work like that. After all, if repeatedly viewing the tape reset the counter, then Ryuji and Reiko would have had more than the seven days in the original story. I asks where her house is, and she explains that she lives in a well. They don't know what that is, so she draws a picture of it. The entrance looks like a pipe! If we had it wrong this whole time and Sadako is actually an evolved form of a piranha plant from Mario? She says her well isn't far from here and he actually runs off, quickly discovering a well, though not Sadako's. So someone else lives in this one? Yeah, but the property values on this one have got to be through the roof. They open it up, ignoring all the charms on it. Sadako has a brief flashback to her looking up from the well at the moon, but in her state they don't see he climbing up too much and falling into the well. Fortunately for them, she's bounced out. What the? Both Sadako and I give her a hug from the fright of that, but then someone emerges from the well. Okiku! When I started the Ring reviews, I pointed out that Japan is filled to the brim with ghost stories, and this is one of them. Okiku is known as the Plate or Dish Ghost, and she's actually one of the inspirations for Sadako. There are many variations on the tale, but the common elements involve one of the plates she was responsible for getting broken or stolen, and she obsessively counts the other plates before being cast into a well, either by suicide or murder, and she returns as a vengeful spirit. Anyway, they ask Okiku if this is her house, and she has to laugh at that. No, not my house. This is more like my tool shed. She explains what a well is, and that anyone who's in a well either got thrown in or threw themselves in. Dead either way. I and he don't seem to know what death is given their confusion on that, though it might more be they're confused given she's transparent, yet Sadako's supposed to be a ghost too, but she isn't. A video. I've heard of a fellow curse like that. Sadako. We should totally collab on something. Okiku says that curses exist thanks to their own strong will and the enduring belief of the living, though yet again the girls are confused. As such, she explains her own ghostly history, with Sadako even calling her my senior colleague as a nod to her origins, and that she broke a very important plate and was so distraught that she threw herself into the well, haunting hateful people ever since. Now she counts the plates she has, but is still missing one. Our heroes, being ever so helpful, give her one of their plates. She's so moved by this act of kindness that for them, the last two kind people in the world, she'll give them some advice. Should you remain with that girl, death awaits you. <gasps> oh my god! He's gonna kill them! Okiku disappears, leaving behind the plate they gave her. That night, Sadako thinks that the girls might be planning to run from her with that revelation, but instead I wants to know if they really have to say goodbye to her tomorrow, that they want to learn more about her and keep playing with her. And thus the next day, they reach Sadako's well, leading to our final chapter, we love you, Sada-chan, but we love Stalin more. Now there's a deep cut for the 15th anniversary. I died alone at the bottom of the well. I was born of my resentment against the world, imbued in the video, and yet people still ignore the FBI warning at the start. All who watch the video are cursed. That is who I am. But if I curse the last two people in the world, then I get the high score! At the well, there's a sign, but the two girls can't read it all. Sadako just says it means the well is filled in. Ai says that their journey is over, so they can spend the rest of the day playing together. However, Sadako knows what the sign actually says. When every last person is gone, the curse will fade. If the curse kills these final survivors, perhaps... I will disappear too. Meanwhile, on the other side of the planet, there's some post-apocalyptic scavenger walking around with a dog going, Oh man, it's great to not be cursed by evil videotapes! In fact, there are no VCRs anywhere near me, and I think I'm gonna keep it that way! That night, they put He to bed, and I invite Sadako to take a walk with her. The art implies that He dies in her sleep. 
but let's table that for a moment. I tell Sadako that she used to have trouble sleeping when it was just her and he, but having Sadako around helped her sleep easier. She couldn't fully read the sign, but she got the gist of it. It told about everything that happened to Sadako. Your video doesn't have a happy ending, right, Sada-chan? Are you kidding? In Ring Kanzenban, the tape ends like this. <laughs> but this week was so much fun. You helped me do everything I ever wanted, so... I'm ready to give you what you want, Sadachan. Sadako writes out, give me an Apple pen for my tablet. However, Sadako's not gonna lose the friendship she's made. She explains that she can record their week together. In the tape, they can be together forever. The two embrace, I saying she loves her. Inside the well, Sadako awakens, wondering if the curse is over, but spots I and he waiting for her up top. The two are dead, but indeed preserved forever in the tape with her. Sadako wonders why she's not gone yet, if that means someone is still alive. And so our manga ends with Sadako turning and looking at the reader, proclaiming, There you are, before starting to crawl out of the panels. Sadako at the end of the world is touching, heartbreaking, wholesome, and shows a truly sympathetic side to this character that we didn't even see in Ringu Zero last week. I should also note that there is some bonus content after the story itself is over. Concept art, of course, a little story about the mangaka, Koma Natsumi, visiting the set of Sadako 2019, and even seeing how much the studio loved the character, but most importantly... The mega happy ending. Ah, oh, the mega happy ending, that's doable. A bonus comic where Sadako is reunited with all the characters of the story called Salon and the Great Beyond. Yamane finally gets to cut Sadako's bangs, which she immediately undoes and foomps new hair for herself. As I said last time, this is not really a horror story. There's a bit here or there that can be thought of as horror, but this is putting a horror character into a new environment and exploring different levels of her. Letting her experience humanity, true humanity, love, compassion, and friendship. While on this journey, she experiences no evil, no one hating or hurting her. People who just accept her whether they know she's a curse or not. Last time, we saw Sadako subsumed by her dark side, betrayed by her father, and losing the only man who loved her. Now obviously you can't just undo everything she went through with a hug or something, but seven days of kindness allowed her to be kind as well. The ending, where Sadako suggests that her curse will end and she'll vanish when the last living person is gone, suggests that even she is trapped in this and wants it to end. That it's not really about her revenge or wanting a child or her rage that really drives her, but a desire to escape this latest horror that she is stuck in. She can't alter the rules of it to save I and He's lives, and doing so would doom her anyway, but she can at least preserve them in some way, let them have fun together forever, and maintain that kindness. And I can't imagine Sadako doing it before this journey started. She truly had an arc in this. What a wonderful book this is, and goddammit, he is way too damn cute and pure for this world. Next time, well, we're gonna get a long-awaited return of Late Night Double Feature to look at Sadako 3D and its sequel. Then we've got a Clone Saga review for the 15th anniversary. But after that, we finally end our look at the ring. We've seen Sadako as an innocent victim, Sadako as a malevolent monster, but now we see her in her ultimate evolution, a YouTuber! So, if this is the Salon and the Great Beyond, do they still have to tip Yamane? Especially after Sadako just foomps out new hair? 
Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!